الجبا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا إنك سميع مجيب الدعاء اللهم اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لسان يفقه قولي السلام عليكم أبنوان ناس تبي باك أجان جزاكم الله خير for joining us الحمد لله رب العالمين it's always good to have this program may Allah accept from all of us يا رب يامين and may Allah سبحانه وتعالى make it pure for His sake يا رب يامين today topic as we have covered part of it in many of our Tuesday program, but today is special for many reasons. Basically, recently we have seen, it's not only in the Muslim community in general, but we are seeing it also in the Muslim community. Mental health is becoming an issue, a phenomena, um, a problem that we Muslims, not only we need to think and talk about it, but actually we need to address it and address it seriously. And the one thing that maybe bi'idhnillah, by Allah grace, will help us to remove this taboo, this, uh, we don't want to talk about it, it doesn't happen to us, it's somebody else, um, is that when we know the history of mental illness and we can, we, when we learn that it is there, it is part of our deen, it is in there in our deen. And it gives me a great pleasure without a lot of introduction to join and to actually introduce our guest for tonight is Dr. Rania Awad joining us from California. And you probably don't need anybody need to introduction or to know about Rania because you probably know her. It's a great pleasure. She's a good friend of mine. I always smile when I see her and I love seeing her inshallah. Soon we'll meet again. We met not too long, alhamdulillah, in a beautiful blessing, blessed gathering, Ya Rabbi Amin. So Dr. Rania is actually a clinical associate professor of psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. She's actually the director of the Stanford Muslim Mental Health and Islamic Psychology Lab and its community non-profit, non-for-profit, which is the maristan.org, associate chief, mashallah, of the Division of Public Mental Health and Population sciences and co-chief of the diversity and culture and mental health. Maybe many of you know this part of her. I don't know how many of you know that she before she pursued her career in psychiatry, she also pursued her career in Islamic studies. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. This is my always passion that you can combine Bi'idnillah dunya and akhira. And so she actually studied in Syria, had ijazat in many of the Islamic sciences and in Quran. And currently she's also uh, served as a senior fellow at Yaqeen Institute and ISPU. And in addition, she also served as a director of the Rahma Foundation, which I had the pleasure of meeting its member and being a, their guest and, and the honor of being their guest actually last month. Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept all your work ya Anya. welcome it's a pleasure to have you here and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use you and me and everybody in his service so I am going to leave it to you tell us about mental health ya Rania. thank the you so work. much well first first I have to say uh you know thank you so much Dr. Haitha mashallah for inviting me here and for our, all the work that you do at the Jannah Institute and the whole entire team barakallah if you couldn't it's so beautiful and wonderful initiative as any after my own heart mashallah this idea of you know really uh focusing on women and their their studies and scholarship and in the dean barakallah fiki mashallah and thank you um and, and for the beautiful <laughs> the beautiful time we've spent together it's though short yeah. but inshallah we'll have much much more uh, time inshallah ta'ala Alhamdulillah. This uh, this conversation today that's really on mental health is, as you said, a beautiful preface is really that um, we need to focus more on it. And the reason for this is not only because we as a Muslim community, uh, communities, all the different communities we have within our diversity of Muslims are in need of this kind of support in this time and day. But especially for me, I've, I think how I'm very passionate about this point that Muslims have always been at the forefront of the discussion of mental health, always in the past. This is, I find this to be our, it's our legacy. It's part of our heritage. It's something that we have to really um, understand. And when we do understand this, all of that stigma goes away. All of that, all those barriers against seeking out help or feeling like it's very Western and it's not part of us, all of this goes away once you start to understand that history. And that was that was my story. I mean, I was somebody who grew up who really did not, um, you know, I, I, it's called internalized stigma. I had a lot of internal stigma against the whole entire field of mental health. 
anything yeah. called psychiatry, psychology. To me, this was backwards. It was something Muslims didn't need. This is my this is my view. And I tell people this, that even when I went to, you know, in college, I didn't even take a single psychology course. SubhanAllah. <laughs> you don't need it. At all. And the reason, and Wallahi, this Allah, Allah subhanahu wa has a way of humbling you. Because I thought, you know, I really remember having this very clear thought in college of what good Muslim girl takes a psychology course? This nonsense. SubhanAllah. <laughs> good Muslim girl. SubhanAllah. <laughs> Where do we come from to where we are now? SubhanAllah. Allah. Allah. And so I really did not have this as part of my um, plans in any way. Like, honestly, there's many people now, mashallah, alhamdulillah, who are really looking to this field and feeling like it's a very viable option and it's a need. But in my, my in going through education myself, as you mentioned, I had studied kind of the Dean Sciences first, alhamdulillah, and I was passionate about wanting to teach in the community, doing whatever I can in service. And I thought, this is actually a very uh, kind of funny story, Dr. Haif, I don't know if you know this, but it connects with you, mashallah, because in, in um, when I was going through uh, my studies, and I decided on medicine. I thought, you know, this is how I can serve people. I was very passionate about helping people. But what I was sure about was that I would become an OB. Oh. <laughs> so I don't yeah, know. And, he, and he's so much so, this is a this is really because you, mashallah, are an OB. So this is probably very funny for you. But so much so that I was dead set on becoming an OBGYN all the way through medical school. And it wasn't until the very, very end, Yanni, I was about to graduate from medical school, my letters of recommendation had already been written. I had taken all my, you know, OB, uh, higher level, uh, you know, training and such. <laughs> so much so that when it flipped at the very end, and there was an incident actually that that happened in our community that really made me think deeply about um, what is this mental health thing and, and, you know, maybe we should be doing more with it. Um, and I can share a little bit more about that story, but it's so back to the OB. That's really funny is that my letters of recommendation still said in them. And, you know, Rania is going to be, you know, wonderful OB. You should be yeah. <laughs> to I where the OB. I, I would have no doubt. <laughs> 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 and so the people interviewing me in the residency programs would say, are you trying to be a psychiatrist or an OB? <laughs> So what's, what's, this is actually, if you don't mind, without detail for privacy. But no, what it's important, you? yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because it speaks to how I didn't even have it on part of my mind, Yanni. And not because I wasn't interested in it, because I really felt this was not a field Muslims needed. I really had that same belief that I know many of the sisters and brothers, who, anybody who's listening here, probably has the same feelings about mental health. I, I did, and I'm not alone. And I know the whole community around me, the one I was raised in, had the same thing. So what happens, subhanAllah, you know, in teaching in the community, the dean teaching, you know, you, you, um, you're teaching whatever subject you're teaching, and then people ask questions. So they ask if it's a fiqh class, they're asking fiqh questions, and you're answering. Um, and then I found out, you know, in time, over a few years, that actually what happens is people ask the, yeah, the, the book questions, but then after that, they start asking personal questions, sure. things related to their home and their family and their background. And I realized very quickly, even though I can answer the halal, haram, yes, no, of the, of the background and, of the dean, I didn't have the training to do this kind of interpersonal, really kind of um, therapy, essentially counseling. I didn't have the means to do this. And uh, the incident that really uh, flipped things for me is we had a, uh, we, we were in the we were teaching here in Northern California, mashallah, and a beautiful community setting, lots of wonderful classes happening, very dedicated students. And then one night, um, one of the students, subhanAllah, had what we today, I now can call it, I now understand that it was called a psychotic break. I didn't oh. know. This. I didn't have the language for this. None of us did. Nobody had this uh, on the whole campus. Nobody had this in the language. And it was very strange and it was very difficult. And, you know, Haram, she had these hallucinations where she thought things were happening that weren't actually happening. And um, and nobody knew what to do. Everyone thought, do we just read, put on on her? Do we just, you know, help? Like, how do we help her? And nobody, subhanAllah, even thought, maybe this is a medical emergency. Maybe she needs to go to a doctor or to an ER. Like, this is how much we didn't know anything about anything. And I remember that night, this is where my husband actually plays a very pivotal role because he kind of turns to me. Um, he made a, a phone call to a 
actually subhanAllah a dentist in our community out of all out of all professions. Mm -hmm. And this particular anybody was very someone um, who was very uh, you know involved in our community and had been talking for a long time about different needs our community has. We're lacking services, all kinds of services we're lacking in our communities. And my husband called him and he described the situation. And, and, and you know, Dr. Rajab Ali, who incidentally is now the, the president of our board at Madistan years later, subhanAllah, Allah. subhanAllah, said to him, this is a mental health issue and she needs to go to a, an emergency room and she needs to have psychiatric care. And everybody else is trying to like, you know, read the ruqyas on her and do the Quran readings, not which is not problematic, but the, on the other hand, it's not going to also solve a psychotic break as 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 an emergency. Yes, as 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 you know, serious as what was happening. And at that point, he turned. My husband turns to me and he says, "Look, Rania, I know you want to be an OB, and you're very passionate about women and women's health and women's wellness. But inshallah, inshallah, there are going to be other people in the community who can help with the deliveries of babies and do all the work that happens with OBGYN. Um, but not everybody is trained in the dean." We need people who are trained in the dean to also help with the mental health considerations. Oh, true, so true. Would you go into psychiatry? And I just looked at him and said, I like, it's almost like this revelation <laughs> happened of some sort. And the immediate thought I had is, oh, I'm going to disappoint my parents. <laughs> <laughs> they always wanted you to be an OB. And, and, you know, the first comment, and, I, you know, we laugh at my parents now, but the first comment out of <laughs> their mouth was, you're not going to be a surgeon? You know, like it's just, you know, everybody's dreams and ideas of, of what it is to be a doctor, even. Even the idea of being a psychiatrist was like low on the total. Yes, yes. Why are you yes. wasting your medical education on this? Absolutely. You're too smart, you know, you're right? SubhanAllah, may Allah forgive us. And we are opening our hearts to everybody, but right. so you. I'm, I'm very open with my story because yes. this is my story. And I know I'm not alone. And I know people are listening to this, wondering about mental health and thinking, no, 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 we don't need this, right? But the reality is, you know, as we study, and subhanAllah, this is where the humility comes in as you study. And you study, of course, there's a range of psychiatric illnesses. Mental health is a big umbrella under which not just the serious illnesses like we saw that night of psychosis. And of course, the ones that we are familiar with, especially after the pandemic, depression and anxiety. Yeah. But it's a whole right. spectrum where even... I tell people everybody has a mental health consideration. They're all like, really? Because they're thinking of the more serious situations, uh, conditions. But think about, you know, people who are going through marital concerns and struggles. Think about parenting and raising children and the difficulties that come with that. Think about people who are, you know, kind of um, just struggling with juggling various aspects of their life, the ups and downs of regular life. All of this is under the umbrella of mental health. And so when we say, no, no, Muslims don't need this, it's almost like we're saying Muslims have no marital problems, they have no parenting problems, they have no yeah. anxiety problems, and this is not real. That's it's not true. Not, not Jannah. Not yet. That's Jannah, exactly. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Inshallah, ya Rabbi. I mean. So sure. tell, us, tell everybody, because I loved it, is the history of it. You know, we, we talked about it the last time we met, we met very, very briefly, you know, the Maristan, what does it mean? Can you... Tell us, share with us, it's the history of it. Because yes. I think a lot of people absolutely don't know about this. Yes, yes, I'm very excited to share about this. And it's part of, and I'll, I'll just wrap it back into my own journey, because even when I thought, okay, subhanAllah, so I'm going to shift into the psychiatry, the first question I had in my head was, well, what, are the most, what does Islam say about this? Right. What did the early Muslims say about this? I mean, I'd studied, right? I'm, I'm, alhamdulillah, like I'm, I'm teaching actively fiqh. I'm, <laughs> at this point, I... Uh, or soon thereafter, I was going, you know, I served those years as a professor at Zaytuna College. I'm teaching actively these, these subjects. And I'm thinking to myself, well, we have, alhamdulillah, access to the primary sources. What was written by the prime, by the early Muslims in our primary resources about uh, mental health, if anything? And I really wasn't even sure anything was there because you see very rarely this conversation. This is years ago now. Alhamdulillah, now the literature yeah. has really progressed. But at that period of time, especially in English, there was very little. And even in Arabic, there was some, but not a lot. And so as we started to dig in this, <laughs> if one of the first things I said to my residency program director, when I went entered into the training, I said, I'm only here because I want to help the Muslims. <laughs> <Whoa>. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm only interested in Muslims. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> they always thought I was kind of a little funny. Mashallah. He said, okay, that's fine. And I said, and my main, they ask you to do a scholarly research project. So I said, my scholarly research project, um, this is at Stanford. I said, I'm going to research what the early Muslims said about mental health because I can't figure it out anywhere. It's not really act, you know, accurately written from the primary sources. And so he said, fine. And so <laughs> in my uh, fellowship, basically, I collected all of the manuscripts that I could find between all the different libraries in our, you know, at Stanford, but also at Berkeley nearby, the beautiful, alhamdulillah, in America, we have this wonderful interlibrary loan system where you can loan books from all over, from libraries all over the U.S. and even internationally. And when you walked into, during this period of my research, when you walked into the office panel, there were more books than anything else, just piles and piles of books. And I was looking at specifically, what did the early Muslims say? And I thought maybe I'll start with medical manuscripts because at least there, in, in currently psychiatry is housed under medicine, under right. school of medicine. So I thought, okay, maybe medical manuscripts. And subhanAllah, I mean, you can't even go very far into the book and immediately it becomes clear. Not only did they work on mental health discussions, but it was very uh, progressive in their thinking. And right. actually a lot of treatments and diagnoses and classifications, I was blown away. Wallahi. And that's only the medical manuscripts. We haven't even brought in the books of spirituality. Right. Or the Ihsan and Tasawwuf. We haven't even brought in the books of philosophy, the books of, uh, you know, all uh, kalam, all the different. Uh, and every one of these contribute to what the Muslims call the field of ilm al nafs. SubhanAllah. Right? Understanding the nafs, understanding the self. And it's very interdisciplinary. It's not just in the books of medicine, it's actually in all the different books that contribute to the understanding of the psyche. And, it, and this is where I have a very, uh, a story that I love so much, subhanAllah, because it really opened my eyes and, and, and changed my tracks, honestly. Um, and this is a, when in looking at all these manuscripts, I came across a ninth century scholar, Dr. Haifa, his name is Abu Zayd al-Balkhi. Yes. And now Abu Zayd al-Balkhi, alhamdulillah, his name is known, but at the time you say this name to anybody and it's a very little known name, not well known right. at all. Right. He, because he's most famous for geography. And he has a whole school of geography named the Belkhian School of Geography after him. But if you go into psychology or medicine, nobody really knew this name. Um, and uh, because he had only one book in this uh, medical book uh, that we know of that survives till today. And it's called Masalih al-Abdan wal-Anfus and translated as Sustenance of the Body and Soul. And the, uh, and the book is beautiful. Half the book is all medical illnesses. The second half is all on psychiatric illnesses. And if you look at it chapter by chapter, he actually has it laid out, one on depression, one on anxiety, one on fears and phobias, one on, uh, you know, anger, and so on and so forth. And when I got to, and I was just amazed by this, but when I got to the chapter, especially the one on obsessions, subhanAllah, I looked at it, and as a trained psychiatrist, I'm looking at this chapter and going, what era am I reading this in? It's the ninth century, but he's writing basically a classification and diagnosis that matches today the way we diagnose OCD. And then I thought to myself, wait a second. I looked into all of my, um, you know, history of psychology. When you look, when you study psychology 101, they give you the history of psychology. And it literally says in the books, OCD is a modern illness. It was discovered in the West is what they say. And the first reference in a medical case study is like the 16th century but only one case study and not very developed. And then fully fleshed out in the 19th century. So it's a new illness, <laughs> according to them. Right. And I'm looking at Al-Balkhi in the 9th century. Yani 9th century to 19th century is a millennium. Right. A full millennium. And I took out this, at this point, I took out the DSM, which is our Diagnostic Statistical Manual of Psychiatry where we diagnose illnesses from. And I pulled out OCD and I pulled out Balkhi. <laughs> I I put them side by side and we published this paper, Dr. Haifa, because it's phenomenal. Point by point, Al Balkhi diagnosed and class he classified first and then diagnosed it. Every single point, what's in the DSM today? DSM is the psychiatric manual that you diagnose. Exactly. Uh huh. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. I mean, I was just, and the story gets better because you're to your point that people don't, <laughs> that we don't know our own history. And so therefore we can't expect that non-Muslims are going to know our history. 
So down the hall from me at Stanford was um, now retired, but at the time he was still there, a uh, like the forefather of OCD, somebody who's- yeah, I remember the story, yes. The main <laughs> forefathers of OCD. And uh, he's written all the textbooks, mashallah, he's very famous. And I thought, okay, let me ask him. So I went down a couple of doors, I knocked on his door. <laughs> You know, I, said, I said, I'm Rania. I'm a resident here. You know, oh. <laughs> I, uh, I think I discovered something about OCD. I think it was discovered in the ninth century, not, not in the 19th. And he just looked at me and he said, he said, no, 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 no. I said, no, no, but really like here it says, and I'm trying to explain to him, Belchi, and he starts pulling out all the papers he published. And he said, he's a very nice man, Mashal, but he's saying, hey, look, look, here's what I said about the Greeks. And here's what I said about the Romans. And there's nothing after that until the modern day. And then I said to him, but can you read Arabic? <laughs> and he stopped a minute and he said, no, can you? And I said, yes. And that's what I'm trying to tell you here in Fenchley. So he stopped and he finally listened a little bit. And then he said, okay, why don't you go translate it and then come back and show me? I said, okay. okay. I went to my office, took a few days, came back and I showed him, Ya Allah, he was so excited about this finding. He was jumping and he so jumped funny. back up and down. He said, this must be published. This is going to change how we just call the history of psychology, the history of psychiatry, right? And and I love to tell the story because when people say, you know, he's not Muslim, subhanAllah, <laughs> but his name, his name is spelled K-O-R-A-N. SubhanAllah, Quran, Quran, <laughs> la ilaha illallah. <laughs> Allah, Allah has his ways of doing things, SubhanAllah. You know? And I wouldn't have thought to publish except that he insisted. And so we did, subhanAllah. And it's really beautiful and amazing because, you know, Dr. Haifa, when I look at the history of psychology and psychiatry, you find that sometimes people don't know anything about the Muslims. So they don't even discuss us in the history of psychology and psychiatry. And sometimes you find authors very kind of that very unfortunate kind of orientalistic view where they discuss us, but they talk about it. Uh, they literally say one of the most famous people, Barrios, who writes about us and history of psychology, psych he says, and the Greeks and Romans did all of this good stuff. The Muslims came around and translated their works, but added nothing. Oh. And then he goes on to talk about the Europe and the flourishing of psychology there. And so you feel very like purposeful, like you're being written out of history, you know? And of course, everything I'm seeing, I'm seeing books and books and manuscripts and manuscripts to the roof about, you know, how much we contributed. And uh, when this paper, when we sent it to publication, they have to do, you know, the blinded peer review. And when the reviews came back after months and months, because I, they said to us, this is too unorthodox. And because I'm trying to rewrite the history, so exactly. <laughs> unorthodox. So they said, we have to have, uh, you know, historians of medicine review this. I said, fine. So they, they took many months before, until they found the historians of medicine. When they came back with their review, they actually wrote and they said, this overturns Barrios. And oh, this wow. shows that he was off and wrong. And actually, the Muslims had a very rich contribution. And even the therapies that Belchi is talking about match the current therapies we do today for OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Subhanallah. Yeah, and he, not only does he talk about talk therapy, he's talking about even a more specific kind of therapy called exposure therapy for obsessions and phobias. Can you imagine? Subhanallah. May Allah forgive our ignorance. I mean. Yeah, really, really. Yeah. The ignorance is not a bliss, subhanallah. So now... This is amazing. And can you talk to us about your lab? Remember you told me the story, how the lab started? And this is how it started. This is exactly how the lab started, subhanAllah. I thought to myself, Ya Allah, there's so much we don't know. Because I would ask all these other Muslims, very learned people too, scholars, teachers of my own. And many of them would say, no, we don't know. But we don't know Belchi. We don't know the story. We don't know anything much, you know, about this. Um, in fact, they had a lot of stigma like I did against the field. And so oh, I thought, no, 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 we need to, we need to really go back because it's in the primary sources. It's right here in the dust of time. And around this time, this is where an, an interesting, important uh, part of the story comes in. I, in Arab, in the Arabic works, I discovered um, a couple scholars, one of whom by the name of Dr. Malik Badri, who passed away earlier this year, actually, Allah Hamal, but this was years ago. And I found that he was writing about Balkhi. But nothing was translated. This is all in the Arabic. And so I wrote to him and I said, you know, I'm, I've I'm writing this paper and shall it's going to get published on <laughs> uh, are, are you doing anything more? And he said, I'm translating the book. 
and now mashallah you can actually go to amazon and and and, and buy al oh. uh, translation very nice mashallah and then i realized that there are people kind of all throughout the world almost like in pockets who are talking about islamic psychology kind of reviving something we used to have as muslims and i thought you know what we need to have a research lab where we do very dedicated work on what is the what did early muslims do and say about psychology what does our deen say about this the framework of psychology and all the things related to muslim mental health so whether we're talking about depression or trauma or whether we're talking about islamophobia all of these things require their own research studies and that's how the lab started subhanallah you know and it's been alhamdulillah running for many years now and mm -hmm. Already yeah. with multiple people in it. Please pray for its success, inshallah. Yes, I met one of your students just recently, mashallah. And again, a young woman, psychiatry, the reason she went in is almost the same story without this amazing detail. But she said, there's a lot of need. I'm finding out very few people, let alone women, Muslims, who want to go into that field. What I needed to share with us, and I'm sure you've seen especially recently, why do you think we Muslims are needing it? How, what, what is the psychiatric issues in the Muslim community? Our issues are, subhanAllah, exactly the same as the communities and societies we live in. I say that because people often will say, no, 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 we don't have divorce problems. Yes, we do. No, 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 we don't have any drug problems. Yes, we do. No, 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 Muslims don't deal with suicide. Yes, we do. You know? And in fact, sometimes because it's so hush-hush and hidden, Sometimes it's even more. In fact, Annie, I'm going to give my trigger warning right now because I'm going to talk about something heavy. And that is the topic of, of, of suicide, just briefly as a case example of this. And so if anybody needs to take a moment and take a step back, because it is a heavy part of the discussion, please do so. Um, but, you know, we did this study just this summer to figure out, you know, how are American Muslims doing? Because you ask, like, what is it that's led us here? And there's many reasons why we're, we're at a point where we and the whole society around us and every society we live inside, we have the same issues they're having. If in fact, we're not protecting ourselves and our children and our youth fully by Islamic principles, right? And even then it's important to point out that some of these conditions, like the sister I said at the very beginning who had psychotic episode, some of this is also biological or it's hormonal or it's genetic. It doesn't even matter the society we live in. Actually, these things are passed down like a genetic hereditary disorder, just like any other hereditary disorder. We don't say, oh, you got diabetes because you're American. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. there's medical conditions here as well. And so because they are unseen, they're un invisible, mostly they're invisible, people kind of blame you for them. They say this is an issue of faith. You're yeah. not a strong woman. You're not a strong believer. Pray more, fast more, make more du'a. And, and maybe the actual issue that they're trying to tell them to make more dua for is a genetic issue or a hormonal issue that actually has medical treatments for it, right? And so part of the really reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to seek out the treatment and to seek out the people of knowledge, right? And, and with it, with it, absolutely, Ruqya, absolutely. Ruqya, Quran, for, uh, ask Allah for forgiveness, give charity, that's... To be honest with you, that's for every single disease. Any any issue happens, this is what I tell people, you know, even my patients. I was like, okay, you want an easy delivery? Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but we need to do one, two, three, four, make sure you have regular prenatal care, this, this, but definitely ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't want to separate, they are together, but we don't want to do only this. Very few people. Very few people, as the Rasul said, and you know that very few who really, really don't need any of these treatment, you know, but this is very few people. Mm -hmm. and he said from his time that is very few people. The general people, you and me and everybody else, like we, I have a headache, this is what I tell my patients, like I have a headache and you take Tylenol or you take whatever medication you take, you have a psychiatric problem. We see it a lot in pregnancy, by the way, yes. uh, Dr. Arania. We see it yes. a lot. Anxiety, fear, uh, uh, depression, postpartum depression. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And, and most of my patients I see are Muslims. And I say, there's nothing wrong with it. We Muslims have the same. A lot created are the same. We're all human. Um, um, exactly. We're all, exactly. We're all human. We're not protected. But we have extra that we need to use it. 
which is our connection with Allah. So do you have some statistics about the numbers in the women in the uh, Muslim community? Like so well, what I can say, what I can say yeah. in terms of levels, people say, do we have more, you know, depression or more anxiety than the people around? There's no evidence of this. It's actually the similar numbers of where we are are the similar. There's not more or less in the Muslim community. What I can say, the one that I that I that came out, but this is what I was starting to say about the this research we did in the summer on the topic of suicide. That yeah. one was very alarming. That was very upsetting to me because we thought, like I said, most of the conditions we find in parallel, in parallel. But when we saw um, uh, uh, this particular part about suicide attempts, I was very alarmed to see that it was actually more than other faith groups. Oh. And that's what we published in JAMA, in the Journal of American Medical Association. And so it was a very important publication because so many in our community deny this completely like no 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 but then we hear headlines and you hear stories and it's a lot of hush hush but i know because we do a lot of suicide postvention which is basically taking care of after the crisis happens taking care of the grief of the community and how do you heal how do you train people properly yeah a lot and and it's clear to us in the in the mental health world we know that this is happening a lot but nobody really wants to talk about it and so then the next question is well why why is this happening? Why do people feel this way? And there's been a lot of stressors on Muslim communities in the last, especially here in the U.S., but really globally too, um, in the last uh, many years here now. Because if you think about, you know, so many of the American Muslims in the, that come to America, Muslims who come to America as immigrants, they're also coming from areas where there's a lot of trauma. There's been a lot of instability, a lot of war. They've seen a lot. They're carrying a lot with them. And then even if the child, their children, first generation, second generation Muslims, they may not have seen the trauma themselves, but because there's intergenerational trauma from the parents who have not processed through and gotten help for this, it's carrying forward in other generations. Then you add to that, of course, social political climate of the last many years with Islamophobia and bullying. And you add to that, of course, you know, anything already at baseline, like I mentioned, biology, genetics, um, you know, the hormonal issues, uh, you know, instability on a, on a biological level, you bring all this together, then of course it makes sense why there's a lot of struggle that's happening at this moment. So to deny any of this is really just to make it worse. Are you seeing it more gender-wise difference, age-wise difference? What we're seeing definitely in, in let's let's take youth, for example, we're seeing that there's certain things that are happening stronger in youth today. SubhanAllah, just this morning, I presented at the American Association of um, Child and uh, uh, the Academy of Child and um, Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. This today was their annual meeting and we presented on COVID-19 and Muslim youth mm -hmm. and how they've been doing. And it's a very interesting study, uh, SubhanAllah, uh, you know, with the uh, Yaqeen Institute actually bringing all the different, it was about 80,000 Muslims in the study. And then we took the portion of youth to figure out what was happening for depression and anxiety. And like every other group, they're higher. They're higher than they used to be. Depression and anxiety is higher because right. the pandemic has been really hard. But what's really interesting to me, subhanAllah, is I'm also seeing with Muslims populations that they're also relying on religious coping. So it's good in the fact that they're actually doing more prayer and doing more dua and relying on Allah. Oh, okay. Alhamdulillah. And that's protective. Right. That's protective. And, uh, and so in addition to, but here's where we say it's very important that if a person truly has clinical depression or anxiety, that they also go to the professional care. They do this together. Our yes. dean doesn't separate science from religion and it doesn't separate, you know, church and state. We don't have the separation. It's all one for us. So this is very important. So to the study, this is a, a beautiful, one of the most important things out of the study was people who had more reliance on God, more tawakkul, they relied and understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that has certainty. And this pandemic has a lot of uncertainty. So if they could tolerate the uncertainty and know that Allah is the only one with certainty, they had less of a chance of developing depression. SubhanAllah. And those that had more uncertainty intolerance, they couldn't handle the uncertainty. They weren't putting that faith in Allah. They had a 60% chance of developing MDD or major depressive disorder. Subhanallah. That's where faith comes in. Yes. That's exactly where faith comes in. Subhanallah. Tadawwur. Rasulullah said, go and seek help. There is no disease Allah created, but he created the exactly. treatment except old age. Subhanallah.
But this is very interesting because that comes back to the relationship of faith. Yes. You know, like, yeah, but it's not only that, but they, they, but they still got treatment, right? Yeah, that's the thing. So what we're saying yeah. is that if you're, you don't sort of uh, leave it at that. If you bring the two together, the faith uh -huh. along with the asbab, taking the actual means to get yourself or your family or loved ones better, then alhamdulillah, there's full treatment available. So what do you recommend? Because I'm sure we have a lot of families listening to us. What do you recommend for the families? Let's focus on the youth first, because this is our future. Yes. If we lose them, we lose, we lose the future. What do you give like recommendations to parents? So my recommendations, Allah Ta'ala, but really I, I feel very strongly, the first and foremost thing is that we don't stick our head in the sand. We don't say, and we don't deny it. We don't go into denial and say, no, 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 no. Or my kid is fine. Actually, I think where we need to understand is that we are, as a Muslim community, we're actually not fine right now. There's a lot of stressors. There's a lot of struggles. And as a humanity, as, as human beings in a pandemic, we're not fine. There's a lot happening right now. So the first thing is not to stick our head in the sand and be in denial. Right? Admit, admit it. It's okay to have it. I'll yes. say that. It's okay. It's not a stigma. The stigma needs to move. Yes. Uh, parents before the, the youth themselves. So, and number two. And honestly, we do find that parents sometimes are the barrier to the kids. The, the new generation, they're okay with mental health mostly. Right. They're not like when I was a kid and other and, uh, older generations than me. Mostly they're okay with mental health, but they come to ask their parents, I want to see a therapist. What does the parents say? No. People are going to find out. What if people knew? You'll never get married. Da, 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 you know, all this stuff, right? And so they're denying the ability of the kid to actually get healthier. That one day they will, inshallah, get married and they will have their own family, but they'll be healthier and not keep repeating the same cycles that we keep seeing in families, right? So that's... So identify, remove identify. the stigma. Number two, to take that step. It's, it's, it, it takes courage. A person has to be brave to take that first step to find care. And there is, alhamdulillah, a lot of different people now in care. I know many people will say, but I only want to see a Muslim. Alhamdulillah, there's many Muslims now that are in the field. A lot yes. of, yeah. Um, in fact, we have on our website a whole a page that has all the directories of all across the U.S. of Muslims who are doing mental health, if people want to access that, different directories. So there's actually many, many different people that are practicing. And honestly, I have to say, too, if there isn't a Muslim professional in the area where a person lives, they should still seek out even a non-Muslim therapist because they're professional. They, they've been trained. You know, maybe it's ideal to have the familiarity of culture and religion, but if not, then they're still a professional. Right, right, right. right. And then... And third is to then make sure that we're actually bringing in the faith into the discussion. I and mean, we have to have the two worlds together. Sometimes we see extremes, people who go only faith. I'm only going to read and pray and do ruqya. Or one extreme of saying, no, 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 none of this matters, the faith part. I'm going to go, uh, you know, give my uh, start therapy. But then the therapy itself, because it's very secular, might actually turn a person or turn the youth, this is what parents are very scared of, that they'll turn them away from Islam. Or they'll blame the religion. They'll tell them to take their hijab off, right? There's okay. fears like this, right? Mm -hmm. So this is where it's important to make sure that you kind of bring the two worlds together. And what do you recommend? Who do they go and see for bringing the faith? Because this is something we have talked about before. Is not many of the Muslim leaders are trained in this. Am I correct? That's correct. That's correct. If a person is seeing a non-Muslim professional, they should also be working with their their personal faith leader, yani someone who's either, if it's an imam who's available at Ustada, or somebody who is um, like even their youth director or youth leader in the community, because you also want to make sure that everything that the therapist is saying is working also with Islam. I say even better if they're all, if they're actually in one person. <laughs> yani yeah. The therapist themselves is Muslim Most and safe. able to bring Islam into the story. That would be better and better, you know. There is actually, the other thing that I'm seeing more, you probably are seeing even more than I am, especially young women, they are going to psy uh, psychology. Mm -hmm. I see this is, alhamdulillah. I, yeah, like you're seeing more psychiatrists, but I'm seeing more psychology counseling, like school counselor now, as we see Muslim, like in our community in St. Louis, the Muslims, uh, the, the, the uh, counselor in our Islamic school is actually a young girl who has 
is now she's working on her PhD. It makes you re and mashallah wear hijab and she's involved in the community. It really makes you happy because wow. she knows she knows where this coming coming from. So let's assume somebody doesn't have this. Where do they go for the for the Islamic uh, support? So well, here's what I want to say. It's really important too, to 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 just point one thing out. If anything, Subhanallah, the pandemic taught us is to do everything virtual, like this. And, yeah. and I, I to, Subhanallah, and it's um and it's a uh, and so has mental health. It's gone virtual too. I say that because uh, sometimes we think we're limited by physical boundaries, but actually with the teletherapy, it turns out that you're able to see Muslim counselors who maybe live a little further away from you but they're within your same state, but they're Muslim. And so maybe that's an alternative as uh -huh. well. Yes, so search, and you're right. I mean, a lot of teletherapy, I mean, the only thing is we can't deliver babies yet. On yes, teletherapy. Yes. That doesn't, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> but of all the things in GYN, like in gynecology, follow up, and we are doing the teletherapy and patients loves it actually. It's yes. more convenient, less, less, um, less cumbersome. So definitely in psychiatry, it's still the human touch is a little, it's not like you have yes, something. It's not exactly the same. Yeah, but it's, an alternative. Like, but it's, a, it's a good alternative. What else you want to tell the Muslims these days? Well, I want, I want Muslims to be very proud of that heritage. So one thing I didn't share yet, I talked a little bit about, you know, um, early Muslim scholars and their contributions and how they really, um, and it was actually the, this is so beautiful, subhanAllah, it wasn't just theory for them. This is really what I want every Muslim listening to think about. It wasn't just theory. Someone like Al-Balkhi didn't just write about it as a theory. They actually put it into practice. This is where you see Ihsan come in, right? Like perfection, like really put this, Allah commands us to give Ihsan. So what did the Muslims do? They didn't just write theories. They actually created institutions of healing. These institutions of healing, this is where I say the proof is in the pudding. Like, how do they take the theory into actual practice? They uh -huh. created the Bimaristans, the Dada Shifa yeah. system, the, the basically Muslim hospitals, healing centers. And it's so beautiful, Dr. Haifa, because when you read this, this is what this for me, this is why we called our new organization Madistan. Uh, Madistan is short for Bimaristan. Yeah. And the reason we called it this is because I believe fully that this is one of the trademarks of Muslim civilization. And one of the most important things Muslims brought to the world, inspired by Islam, inspired by the very hadith that you brought up earlier, Dr. Haifa, of, you know, if Allah sends an illness, he promises basically to send yeah. with it its cure. And so, and we're told to seek out cures. Tadawu ibadullah. Yeah. Exactly. Out, it's an order. It's an order. It's an obligation. Exactly. It's like salu, like shun, like fast. Yes. Yes. That's exactly what he said. Subhanallah. Yes. And so, what did the Muslims then do? They created institutions of healing. They took the theories, like what Balkhi did, and others, uh, Ibn Sina, Ar Razi. Ar Razi actually is very famous to creating. And you know what they created? They were the first in human history, to our knowledge, that in their hospitals, there were hospitals before Muslims, but in their hospitals, they had a section for mental health. They had a section in the hospital for psychiatric illnesses. SubhanAllah. And this wow. is 9th century. <laughs> yes, yes. It actually, 8th century, even before this, mashallah. Before and, and onward, and everywhere Islam traveled, as Islam's the Ummah spread and expanded into more and more countries and areas, everywhere Islam went, in every major metropolitan city there, you found Maristans. Everywhere. It's a trademark. And why did they have mental health within the hospital system? And later they had whole wing, a whole wing of the hospital dedicated to just mental health. Why? Because in Islam, we have a very holistic understanding. Mind, body, soul. You don't disconnect the mind from the body. You don't take the soul out. When you study ilm and nafs, they're talking about the qalb, right? Not the physical heart, but the metaphysical heart, yeah. right? The aql, the cognition. And then you have the nafs and the ruh. The ihsan, oh, I should translate. The, the, the qalb or the kind of metaphysical heart, the aql or the cognition. Then you have the nafs, the self, the ruh, the spirit, right? And then you have the ihsas, the emotions. This is the model Imam al-Ghazali um, created. You have this beautiful model of a holistic understanding of the human being, the psyche. 
So when they, it wasn't just theory, when they actually made the institutions, they made sure that mind, body, and soul were all treated. There was a place to treat all of it. And there were treatments developed for it. And I love when you look at, um, since we, we've been talking today about Balkhi, I'll use him, but many of them have the same thing, Ibn Sina, Razi, all of them. But when you look at, uh, for example, I'll use Balkhi, even OCD, the chapter I was telling you about, when you look at his treatment section, he has uh -huh. three things. He says, and this is beautiful, exactly, mind, body, soul. He says, you have to be able to address the problem, that here it's, let's say, obsessions, OCD, with uh, talk therapy. Muslims created talk therapy. Therapy, people are so no no this is a western thing uh, it's not belonging to us we create <laughs> we developed it and we created talk therapies as muslims and then he says then you must take the medications for it and he gives whole recipes and these books and books i was reading whole recipes concoctions of medications for different illnesses and third he says you must pray to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to cure you there you go <laughs> That's it. Jama al khaira kulla. Exactly. He gathered the whole khair. Acknowledge, take the treatment, and then, and I will say not then meaning after, it's actually the same time. Yeah. It's all together. I have a problem, I'm going to see the specialist, and I'm going to ask the most specialist, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, this is exactly what we almost, and I will say in everything, but specifically in a psychiatric problem because we don't see it as a disease. Mm -hmm. We brush it. Brush it. I see it all the time. I'm much smaller uh, um, field than you, but I see it in pregnancy. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Allah, oh, wow. it's the hardest thing to tell the, the Muslim patient. I was like, you need the medication. Literally, may Allah forgive me. Sometimes I was like, listen. I don't worry about you now, but I worry very much about you after you deliver. Delivery. Two people you have to worry about. It's you and the baby. And, mm -hmm. and it's real. It's going to help. It's not going to harm the baby. It's going to be effective. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I was like, I'm sorry. There is. So I think acknowledge, and if anything comes from today, is that we Muslims should not look at psychiatric problem as a deficiency, as a stigma as I don't have it in denial. I remember very well, um, and I actually, I remember was one of the first times I contacted you because I was like, how do I send them, remember, right? And this family, I mean, she was talking to me about her son. And immediately I was like, he has an issue. It's a major issue. He probably was bullied in, this, in the school. And no, no, no. I said, what do you mean, no, no, no? This is a very smart young man, suddenly becomes all the F. Mm -hmm. And then he doesn't sleep well, so, you know. So he, here you go. What else you want to give our viewers to remember? Yes, this piece about the 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 that uh, I think we were starting to say about the, you know, the the pride and the heritage. At the very beginning, I was saying yeah. if we just knew our history and our heritage, if we knew that Muslims, and this is so beautiful, Doctor Haifa, I want people to really know this point. Um, that it should be like this on the top of our tongues, tip of our tongues. If we talk about who are the first in history to really create psychiatric institutions, psychiatric wards? Muslims were known for humane medicine. Humane medicine. I love the word. Wallahi. And, yeah. and it's not like this in the Muslim world today. It needs to come back because we've inherited so much of that colonial backwardness. Wallahi. And those stigmas and barriers that we didn't have as Muslims. You know what we had? We had Bimaristans with flowing water fountains and greenery yeah. with talk therapy and music that well, Muslims created music therapy, tones, intonations, using the maqamat, using adhan, using Quran to help with calming a person down if they're too anxious or, or bringing them up if they're too depressed. And we have a whole science on this, right, that the Muslims created. It, we, we used art therapies. We used, we used color and sound. Beautiful, beautiful, and very humane and clean. And, and, we use the awqaf, the endowment system. I hope somebody is listening to this and one day says, I want my endowment one day to be a, a Madistan in the future. This is my goal, inshallah, make dua from each other. Bring Ameen. the Madistan to reality. They use their endowment for education and for medicine. Yes, and, they, and there was tenafus, there was competition between the people who were wealthy families of where they would put their endowment. And they would compete with each other to put it in 
the hospital systems because they wanted the ajr, the, the, the sadaqa jariya, the, the reward and the ongoing charity of healing the ill. SubhanAllah. Because our deen commands us to take care of the ill and to visit the ill. So you know where they would put the bibaristans? They wouldn't put them in some far away place. They put them in the center of town. SubhanAllah. Because then you had to do what the hadith says and visit the marid, visit yes. the in, in fact, in Damascus, subhanAllah, the door of the old city of Damascus was the door of the Madistan. And to that extent, it was in the center of town. SubhanAllah. Our Muslim, yeah. Annie, we have such progressive value, and nobody was, nobody had to pay. Because there was the awqaf, the endowment system, and yeah. because they went from bait al-mal and used zakat money, look how progressive we were to treat this. Nobody had any problem in getting care. There were no barriers to care. SubhanAllah. So and where, where have we come from and where oh, are we now? Oh. Now I was like, where do we start? <laughs> where we do start. We, we, we start. Have, we, have, we, have, we have six minutes, unfortunately, left. What do you want to leave us with, yeah, Dr. Arani? I want people, inshallah, to be proud of this heritage, to bring down the stigma, because sometimes it may not be you that's having the issue, but it could be one of your loved ones, a family member, somebody else. And when you have this knowledge and you have this uh, you let go of this internal barriers that are keeping us from actually getting the kind of care that we need. Or you're somebody who's in the sciences and said, or even if somebody who's a businessman for that matter, or woman, <laughs> and says, I'm going to dedicate my time, energy, and efforts into furthering this field, the system that the Muslims had done so much work in, revival. It's literally a revival. When we start to lower these stigmas down, Dr. Haifa, we're able to actually have our community members get healthier and better, and our loved ones and ourselves. We're able to heal our communities, right? And then by extension, we do what, what we as Muslims have always done. Heal everywhere we go, not make it worse, make it so much better. Like the Madistans, the trademark, everywhere in Islam we went, even to Spain, there's so many Madistans, right? Like this is where we need to, this pride in our heritage and this lack of denial and stigma and actually contributing, being productive members of the society to be not just our communities, but to all people. Because these Madistans, for example, had Muslims and non-Muslims yeah, treatment. It wasn't yeah. just treatment for Muslims. Everybody was welcome. You know, as you said, this the dua of Sayyidina Isa when he said, kunt, when he was introducing himself, Sayyidina Isa in Surah Maryam, and he said, who I am, and he said, Allah made me Mubarak. And one of them, I remember one of my teachers used, used always to tell us, she was a she actually, it was like the meaning of may Allah make you Mubarak inama kunti. May Allah make you blessed wherever you are. Amen. And this is how it is. Whether maybe I am not affected, maybe none of my family, but maybe I can help my neighbor. Maybe I can help my coworker. Even just talking about it, I think the first step, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's your field, Yadi Rani. But I think number one, we need to start talking about it. Just yes. talk about it no, in our communities, in our masajid. Let's, you know, we have programs about this and that and that, which is all very important. As you said, fiqh and all these things, it's important. But also we need to have this part of it. Our youth specifically, but now you are even seeing it with the adult, but specifically the youth more. Let's talk about it. Let's accept it. It's it's an affliction from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one who cures it. But he also told us how what measures we need to take. I loved it, Ya Vitora Rania, but we have to stop, unfortunately. But this is not good. That's right. That's right. That's the beginning it's, of the conversation. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Jazakillah khair. May Allah reward you. There was one question mm -hmm. only. If you can translate it, because it looks like the sister doesn't know English well. She said, what is OCD in Arabic? Oh, in al Balkhi's book, he called it Wasawis al-Sadr. So waswasa, but not just the regular waswasa that all of us have, me and you, all of us have waswasa to a certain level. This is what we call pathological waswasa. Yani waswasa qahari, right? The, the, that's, it's kind of like a, an, a, a pathological uh, obsession and compulsion, which today we call obsessive compulsive disorder. Or OCD. And there's a question if you see it on the screen. Children who grew up without parents, may Allah protect them, have their own mental issues, mm -hmm. what often are visible, in, which is often visible in behavior. There must be some pattern in development. Yes, this is true. Definitely. In fact, one of the things we say often in therapy is we talk about the long arm of childhood. 
Why is that? Because there's so much that happens in the beginning of child development. And whether a person actually, whether a child has parents or not, or had, you know, the reality is all of us have some level of uh, uh, um, difficulties that happened in our development and some much more than others. And so a lot of the work we actually do in therapy, and we actually call it work because it takes a lot of work to be able to go backwards and figure out what were those pieces, because they do then develop affect your behaviors and affect how you interact with the society around you. But there is, this is a most important point, and we didn't say this yet, so panel, I'll say it now, that so many of these conditions are treatable. I won't say curable, because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cures fully, full cures, shifa is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they're treatable. So we must treat and that's what the profession does inshallah exactly may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure everyone may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to live with peace ya rabbi anta salam minka salam hayyina rabbana bi salam you are the peace peace originates from you spread the peace on this earth and everything spread the peace inside our hearts as an individual and may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala show us the truth as truth and help us to follow it and falsehood as falsehood and help us to stay away from it Dr. Arania, again, it's a pleasure always in person and virtual. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to meet again soon, bi-idhnillah. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika, ashadu an la ilaha illa ant, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayh, sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi 